We brought you earlier this week the story of uh, Anat Schwartz and the New York Times and the story they put out about alleged systematic rapes by Hamas on October 7th. That story had already uh, fallen apart. Even by their own fact checkers, they could not put out an episode of The Daily based on this bombshell supposedly investigation that they put together um, that was bylined by three different individuals. So even their own fact checkers were not willing to stand by this report sufficiently to put it in their premiere podcast. Then we learned, as I detailed earlier this week, that Anat Schwartz, one of the co-authors of this piece, literally had never worked in journalism, had not a single byline prior to joining the New York Times in November, gets put on this incredibly fraught, sensitive investigation. Um, We also learned that prior to her time, on on October 7th, just before she joined the Times, she was liking on social media overtly genocidal posts calling for Gaza to be turned into a, quote, slaughterhouse, okay? That post that she liked was so genocidal, actually showed up in the South Africa ICJ filing, alleging that uh, Israel is, in fact, committing genocide. Well, now we have a uh, report from Ryan Grimm and uh, some of his colleagues there at The Intercept that looks into how Anat ended up in this piece, how this investigation unfolded, and it is really quite something. Let's go ahead and put this up on the screen. So the headline here from Jeremy Scahill, Ryan Grimm, and Daniel Bogoslaw, uh, quite a powerhouse of of byline there. Uh, Between the hammer and the anvil, the story behind the New York Times October 7th expose. So a lot of this comes from both talking to people inside the Times, a lot of other reporters at the Times are utterly disgusted with the way that this all went down. And then part of it was, Sagar, they got their hands on a Hebrew language interview that Hanat, that Anat uh, was able to do. And so they have, in her own words, the way that she conducted this quote unquote investigation. So here's a quote from her. She apparently, she herself was a little wary of being put on this and felt herself to be unqualified, but nevertheless persisted. She says, quote, victims of sexual assault are women who have experienced something and then to come and sit in front of such a woman, who am I anyway? I have no qualifications. In terms of reporting about the internal turmoil at the New York Times, Ryan says the fear among Times staffers who've been critical of the paper's Gaza coverage is that Schwartz will become a scapegoat for what is a much deeper failure. She may harbor animosity toward Palestinians, lack the experience with investigative journalism, and feel conflicting pressures between being a supporter of Israel's war effort and a Times reporter, but Schwartz did not commission herself. And her nephew, by the way, that's the other piece of this, is the third author of this piece was a relative of hers who was almost similarly unqualified um, for any sort of reporting of this level. So she did not commission herself and her nephew. Senior leadership at the New York Times did. Schwartz said as much in an interview with Israeli Army Radio on December 31st, quote, the New York Times said, let's do an investigation into sexual violence. It was more a case of them having to convince me, she said, her host cut her off. It was a proposal of the New York Times, the entire thing, and she goes on to insist that, yes, it was. If you read through this piece, uh, Ryan tracks, again, through the narration of Anat about how she conducted this investigation, how it was very much a hunt for justifying a conclusion they had already come to. They wanted to find the evidence that systematic rape was used as a weapon of war on October 7th. And so she went out and effectively scoured the country, talking to people at hospitals, at crisis centers, anyone she could try, try to find to justify the conclusion she had already come to. Ultimately, and this is why the, you know, fact check fell apart and why the the piece itself came under such scrutiny, ultimately she ends up relying on the testimony of some of these uh, Zaka volunteers who were, uh, that was the group that invented the 40 beheaded babies hoax and a number of others, and the testimony of another individual who similarly has been proven to have invented falsehoods to, you know, justify the barbarism of the Israeli assault on Gaza. And so, and even, you know, the one witness that she gets, 
He changed his stories multiple times. Um, she ended up violating what was the one thing that Jeffrey Gettleman, the lead author on this report, had told her that you have to have multiple sources to go with the word of this one eyewitness. And so, you know, the whole thing is just an absolute mess. And her lack of qualifications here are still the most head scratching thing I can imagine. The last thing that I'll mention here, put this next piece up on the screen from Z Squirrel, who really, by the way, total credit. Um, to this account, who did all of the initial digging to uncover her lack of experience, her previous social media history, et cetera, and really set off a firestorm. So her nephew, Anat's nephew, was the third author of this piece, um, Adam Sella, who also had apparently only written a couple of prior articles on the subject of food and cooking to be their lead on the ground reporter um, on this extraordinarily sensitive piece. Uh, the uh, first name on the byline, Gettleman, he's the one that I played you the other day who said that, oh, I'm not really, evidence isn't really what I'm doing here. I'm just looking to tell the, you know, tell the stories. Apparently, he was very little involved in the actual investigation on the ground. It was mostly Adam and Anat who are wildly inexperienced, and then you end up with what is an absolute scandal and meltdown happening at the Times right now. Yeah, I mean, well, I read the report, and it's like, you know, you know, usually when there's, ugh, I, I, this is why it's so difficult. When there's, you, you sound like a monster when you're like questioning claims of widespread rape or whatever. But yeah. look, been questioning it since Rolling Stone article came out, so I might as well continue to do it. But I read this, and it's like, well, I called all 11 hospitals, and they said that they didn't exist. I mean, in my head, it's like, do you even need to keep hunting then if we're talking about the claim of widespread? And again, I mean, why does this, any of it matter? Because these are indelible stories. They get lodged in the mind, in which if you ask people on the street, they say it's probably true. And it's one of those where it gets used as justification then for some of the actions by, or disproportionate use of force or whatever, you know, by Israeli forces. If you were to ask people inside Israel, they'd probably believe it too. And it all traces back really to this. If we, I mean, this is the other thing where I almost, you know, you again, you want to scoff a little bit. When you want to look back at every time where rape was actually widespread, you don't have to go looking for it, okay? Go ask anybody in the Congo or go, you know, the Democratic Republic of the Congo where rape genuinely was used as a weapon of war. Uh, go look at the Soviet invasion of Berlin. Like, you don't have to look for it. They will tell you and the evidence of it all shows up nine months later and it's horrific in, in terms of the things that happened at that time. It's like, if it really was that widespread, then you wouldn't have to even go coax, like, what was it, a single individual who was anonymous, and then the claim doesn't work out. It's like the entire thing. It's just, it's just, look, you know, October 7th was bad enough. Why do we have to go looking for bogeymen that don't exist? You know, a bunch of people were killed, including kids. Enough. That's it. Like, what? why? But, I mean, I think we know why, for media purposes and others. And I think that's kind of what, uh, I think that is really what is disturbing about this entire thing. Yeah, absolutely. There were horrific atrocities that were committed right. by Hamas against innocent Israelis on October 7th. There is no doubt about that. That is crystal clear. Yeah, it's on video. Right. Crystal clear, yeah. right? And I'm not saying there was no rape mm -hmm. on that day, but that's not the claim that has been made. The claim is that it was used systematically as a weapon of war. And they just were not able to find the evidence that came anywhere close to backing up that assertion. And at every turn, when they run into a roadblock, you know, oh, all the hospitals say that they didn't find it. It's well, well, they probably killed all the women that they mm -hmm. raped. Well, okay, what about forensic evidence from, you know, the bodies of the women who were slaughtered on that day? Well, you know, there's, because of Jewish custom, they were buried quickly, so we didn't mm -hmm. co collect any of that forensic evidence. Um, well, what about, you know, we went to talk to these uh, crisis workers, you know, and they won't tell us anything either. Well, it's probably just because they want to protect their patients, et cetera. There was like, they set off with, we have come to this conclusion that this happened, and now we're gonna try to backfill in the evidence. And they have this line in uh, Ryan's piece at The Intercept. He says, at every turn, when the New York Times reporters ran into obstacle, obstacles confirming tips, they turned to anonymous Israeli officials, not the most credible sources, mm -hmm. or witnesses who'd already been interviewed repeatedly in the press, who, by the way, those witnesses, again, were caught shifting their stories depending on what outlet they were talking to and what day it was. Months after setting off on their assignment, the reporters found themselves exactly where they had begun, relying overwhelmingly on the word of Israeli officials, soldiers, 
And Zaka workers, again, though that's the group that fabricated 40 beheaded babies and a bunch of the other uh, things that have been completely disproven, to substantiate their claim that more than 30 bodies of women and girls were discovered with signs of sexual abuse. On the Channel 12 podcast, Swartz said, the last remaining piece she needed for the story was a solid number from the Israeli authorities about any possible survivors of sexual violence. We have four, and we can stand behind that number, she said she was told by the Ministry of Welfare and Social Affairs. No details were provided. The Time story ultimately reported there were at least three women and one man who were sexually assaulted and survived, apparently, again, just based on the word of Israeli officials. There was one particularly revealing anecdote here that I just think really gives away the game. So in that Times piece, they center a lot of their storytelling around the family of a woman who was murdered on October 7th named Gal Abdush. Mm -hmm. And um, they uh, claimed in the piece that she had been raped, that her body bore the signs of having been raped. There had been some video that circulated of her that where she had, you know, after she'd been slaughtered, she didn't mm -hmm. have pants on. And so that's basically what they were basing all of this on. And a third of the time story details this story of what they're calling the, quote, woman in the black dress. Well, after the report comes out, the family is furious because the Times reporters, they're saying, you never told us this was about rape. You just said this was about October 7th and remembering Gal. They actually have phone messages that they believe, you know, undercut the idea that there was time for her to have been raped. Her family came out aggressively and said, this is a lie. Um, you know, the media needs to stop spreading this, et cetera. So that really fell apart. But Gal com comes up in Ryan's piece here as well, where that video of her that they needed to make central to the piece, the person who was the owner of that video didn't really want to cooperate with them. And um, the owner says that, uh, that they called me, that would be Adam and Anand, called me again and again and explained how important getting that video is for Israeli Hasbara, which is their term for propaganda. So a New York Times supposed journalist telling this person you have to cooperate with us, not because it's in the interest of journalism and exposing the truth and the story that we're, no, because this will serve the interest of Israeli government propaganda. I mean, that is as much of a clear cut as admission of what was going on here as you could possibly get. Um, you know, the Times is, in their comment to, to Ryan here, standing by the story, uh, a not put out a statement this morning. She says, I'm thankful to the New York Times for standing behind the important stories we have published. The Times didn't just stand behind me, but also behind many women whose stories needed to be told. The recent attacks against me will not deter me from continuing my work. And she's got in there a screenshot of Times International editor Phil Pan saying in a statement to Ryan in the Interstep that he stands by the work, quote, Ms. Schwartz was part of a rigorous reporting and editing process. She made valuable contributions. We saw no evidence of bias in her work. We remain confident in the accuracy of our reporting and stand by the team's investigation. But as we have said, her likes of official, of offensive and opinionated social media posts predating her work with us are unacceptable. Um, as a reminder, a not liked genocidal post and one's calling for, uh, you know, propaganda to be used to conflate Hamas with ISIS. Um, she also backed the beheaded babies hoax in her social media posts. She had never worked as a journalist before. She was like a small time film um, maker and previously had served in the IDF in an intelligence unit. So yeah. there you go. Sketches. Extraordinary, extraordinary situation. Hey guys, if you like that video, go to breakingpoints.com, become a premium subscriber and help us build the best independent media organization on the planet. That's right, we're subscriber funded, we're building something new, we wanna replace these failing mainstream media organizations. So again, to subscribe, it's breakingpoints.com.